It was great to see the work that you're doing and the cars that you're building, especially when you consider the fact that just over a year ago, the future here seemed very much in doubt. Now, before, before I make my remarks, I've, I've got to disclose I'm a little biased here because the first new car that I ever bought was a Grand Cherokee. Up until that point, I had had some old beat up used cars. You know, they, they, they were not state of the art. And I still remember walking into that showroom and, and, and driving out with that new car. I had that new car smell, and everything worked. I wasn't used to that. Had all these, uh, everything was electronic, and I, I had I, all my, I had had to roll up my windows, up until that point. Uh, so, so I've got some some good memories uh, of that car. But I've got to tell you, when I said in uh, this car, this is a better car. This is a state of the art car. This is a world class car right here. Now. I want everybody to think about where we were. We were in the midst, when I took office, of a deep and painful recession that cost our economy about eight million jobs, eight million jobs, and took a terrible toll on communities like this one. Our economy was shrinking about 6% per quarter. Now this morning we learned that our economy grew by 2.4% in the second quarter of the year. So that means it's now been growing again for one full year. Our economy is growing again instead of shrinking. And that's a welcome sign compared to where we were, but we've got to keep on increasing that rate of growth and keep adding jobs so we can keep moving forward. And that's especially important for places like this. In the 12 months before I took office, the American auto industry lost hundreds of thousands of jobs. Sales plunged 40 percent. Think about that. The industry looked like it was going over a cliff. And as the financial crisis and the vicious recession collided with an industry that for too long had avoided hard choices and hadn't fully adapted to changing times, we finally reached the point where two of the big three, Chrysler and GM, were on the brink of liquidation. And that left us with very few choices. One choice, one option, was to keep the practice of giving billions of dollars of taxpayer money to the auto industry, but not really forcing any accountability or change. So you just keep on kicking the tough problems down the road year after year, and hopefully seeing if you could get more and more money out of Washington. A second option was to do nothing and risk allowing two of the big three to disintegrate. And that could have meant the end of an industry that, like no other industry, represents so much of what makes up the American spirit. This industry has been the source of deep pride for generations of American workers, whose imaginations led to some of the finest cars the world has ever known and whose sweat built a middle class that has held up the dreams of millions of our people. But look, the hard truth is this industry lost a lot of jobs in recent years. Some of those jobs aren't coming back partly because automakers have become so much more efficient than they used to be. This is a, this is a lean, mean operation. And so there are people who still lost their jobs, haven't been hired back, and it wasn't their fault Mistakes were made in managing the company that weren't theirs. 
So that's why we've still also got to make targeted investments to encourage new private sector manufacturing growth. We've got to encourage clean energy. That's why we're taking steps to help communities revitalize and redevelop old shuttered auto facilities, preparing them for new industries and new jobs and new opportunities. I'll give you an example. Those, those investments that we're making are helping to create an entire new advanced battery industry take root right here in Michigan. That industry was producing only 2% of the world's advanced batteries last year, but by 2015, we expect to produce 40% of the advanced batteries that go into our cars. And we're going to do it right here in Michigan, all across the Midwest. Investments like those mean jobs for American workers to do what they've always done build great products and sell them around the world. As I was thinking about what to say today, uh, an extraordinary story was brought to my attention. I, I, I don't know if, if they're here, but I, I think some of you must know. Uh, Fourteen of your fellow employees at the plant won the lottery. Where are they? That's one, a couple of them right there. Lunch is on them, by the way. <laughs> now, the first assumption people might make is, you know, after you win the lottery, you just kick back and you retire. Nobody, nobody fault folks for that. This is tough work. But it, most of them, they just want to keep on working. And, and I, 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 is, uh, is, is, uh, is William Chanteau here? He not? Well, he bought, he was one of the guys who bought one of the winning, he bought the winning ticket, right? Turns out he, he used, uh, some of the winnings to buy his wife one of the Jeep Grand Cherokees that you build right here. He called it a sweet ride. And he's going to pay for new American flags for his hometown because he loves his country. And he's going to keep coming to work because he loves this plant and he loves these workers. So don't bet against the American worker. Don't bet against the American people. We got more work to do. It's going to take some time to get back to where we need to be. But I have confidence in the American worker. I have confidence in you. I have confidence in this economy. We are coming back. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. God bless you. And God bless the United States.